<laughs> the, the title of Adriana's paper is uh, Seaworthiness. So, uh, important topic Seaworthiness in the context of marine insurance contract. Adriana, the floor is the best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ethan, for this introduction, which uh, put the sweater uh, weight on my shoulder. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm always very excited when I have to give a lecture, uh, especially uh, in such a nice society. Uh, company and uh, uh, first of all, uh, okay. hello to everyone. I'm very sorry that I uh, missed uh, most of the week uh, of this lovely event, uh, and and I missed uh, the socializing part uh, of the event. Hopefully, at least uh, this evening uh, we will be able to to make it up, yeah, to make good uh, for for the time one. Yeah, uh, so just, I will I will move on to my topic because it's quite quite a, a complex topic which I will try to simplify because um, the idea is I think that the, all the all the audience, including the students, can can uh, can follow. And in fact, uh, I pitched the um, level of uh, of this lecture uh, really to adapt it to. To the students, uh, so uh, uh, dear professors who already know everything about this topic, please bear with me <laughs> and uh, interrupt uh, uh, freely uh, if you have anything to add. Uh, as well, uh, I would like to invite everyone really to to interrupt if you have any questions or comments uh, or ideas uh, that might come to your mind during during this uh, lecture. So the topic is secret deposits of, of marine insurance and uh, the structure of the lecture uh, will be the following. Uh, first, we will talk about the legal concept of seaworthiness in general. Uh, then we will go through a comparative uh, um, analysis of, of the legal solution and effects of unseaworthiness uh, in context of marine insurance. Um, comparing some basic principles that you find in the common law tradition countries and the civil law tradition countries, um, and uh, in terms of conclusions, we will just uh, shortly uh, think about uh, future the future of this uh, legal notion, especially in the view of the technical technological development. And uh, automatization machine. But before we start seriously, I would like to think about some ideas and examples. Um, and basically, there are two questions that I would like to think about Is the ship seaworthy? And is there insurance coverage? If, for example, the ship has a crack in the top. If there is a latent defect in the engine, <laughs> if the master is not alone, if the death sonar does not work, if the ship certification is incomplete but the ship is fitted with fully fixed to navigate, if the ship management company has no valid ISM certification. If the ship's firefighting equipment is fully fit, but the crew does not know how to use it. If the ship is overloaded. If the passage plan is defective. And, or if cargo of chocolate and Coca-Cola are <laughs> stored together in the same hatch. Uh, hole, actually. So, uh, just something to think about, and there is one, only one correct answer to all of these examples and to both questions. And what do you think it is? It depends. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it depends on a number of things. And really, the point of this lecture is to see how how this uh, depends. 
So still working at in general. Um, the notion is really a question of that. It is a question of the actual condition of shit, its physical properties, properties of its equipment, uh, stores, supplies, uh, crew, um, documentation. So it is really very relative in many respects, in at least four respects. Uh, uh, and one that is one of these respects is that it is relative also to the legal context uh, in which it is applied. So the legal notion of seaworthiness depends on whether we are viewing this uh, concept from the perspective of the carrier of goods or carrier of passengers or member charters, for example, those contracts, shipbuilding, insurance, safety, pollution prevention, general leverage, limitation of liability, sea fires in contracts, contracts in seaworthiness appears in all these areas. And it is relative, uh, the legal consequences of uh, seaworthiness are relative to the uh, context that it is applied in. Uh, so that is one aspect of relativity of this notion. Another one is that it is not an absolute standard uh, throughout time because it continuously increases along with the developments in the technology in marine transport and it follows the national and international regulations, the safety of navigation and pollution prevention. So it's also in that respect a living, a living, um, it has a life of its own because it developed along with the with these uh, technology and regulatory um, development and evolution. And, and finally, it is also very important to always have in mind that the awareness is always relative to the certain circumstances of a particular case. So we have to assess uh, sea worthiness in the context of a particular voyage, of a particular marine adventure that the ship is actually engaged in. Uh, so just a, sh a short note to um, give you a picture of how the legal notion changes depending on the legal context. In the, uh, in the context of carriage, um, seaworthiness um, relates to the physical fitness of a, of a ship to perform a contract with a voyage. Uh, and in particular, when we are talking about carriage of goods, uh, ship, it is always a ship's fitness to safely navigate, so to encounter the ordinary perils of the seas to which it is exposed, uh, expected to be exposed uh, during contact in the voyage. Ordinary perils, so not extraordinary, but ordinary perils. Uh, so we're talking about the physical condition of the ship's power and machinery, its equipment, installations, uh, men. Uh, but also, besides the physical fitness, uh, carriage of goods always take into account the cargo worthiness so of the ship. And uh, this is another component which, as you know, is constituent part of the notion of seaworthiness in this legal context. So the ship's business to receive and carry the particular cargo, uh, to safely load it, store it, preserve it, transport, and unload the cargo at the destination. Um, and in, in doctrine, in legal theory, we uh, can find this approach where the, the legal writers say, okay, we have general seaworthiness, which refers to the Condition of a ship, how its ability, construction, condition of hatches, uh, a technical sound machinery, equipment installation, firefighting system, etc. etc. And then we have special seaworthiness, which is relative to the particular to the particular contract of voyage. Um, so the ship must have sufficient partners in store for that voyage. Sufficient and qualified crew, adequate and updated notable charts for that particular voyage. Uh, additional equipment for navigation in special conditions, for example, if, if, uh, uh, if a voyage involves uh, 
ice navigation, uh, and etc. In the case of character passengers, again, seaworthiness is a physical condition of a ship, so safely navigate, and also the ship has to fulfill certain special requirements relating to the character passengers in particular, like safety, sanitary, health requirements, etc. In shipbuilding, the shipbuilder's obligation is to uh, deliver a ship in accordance with the requirements of the contract. Um, and but also a ship which is um, going to be able to receive all certification according to uh, statutory classification requirements. Uh, so here we are mostly talking about general seaworthiness. In Bearboard Charter, also, in principle, we are talking about general seaworthiness, except if the contract specifically and expressly requires that the ship complies with some special requirements, uh, uh, which depend on, on a special use, for example, of the vessel. Um, again, in the context of Public maritime law, especially the law of safety and security and pollution prevention. Uh, this is a very technical, again, issue. Seaworthiness uh, means uh, compliance with the, with the applicable international and national statutory requirements, requirements of SWAT, the requirements of periodic inspections and certification, um, completeness of the ship's uh, documentation. And then uh, there is a question maybe to think about what do you think is a formal compliance with the statutory and classification requirements proof of actual seaworthiness? What do you think? If a ship is fully compliant with all statutory requirements, formally fully compliant, it has all the certificates, all the documentation is in line with the with the flag state, port state requirements, but is this also prove that it is actually safe worthy. So, uh, sorry, safe worthy. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Anyone? <laughs> no, no, it's it's not really a, a definitive proof. It's a, it's a presumption. Well, there is a strong presumption then that the ship is is really uh, safe worthy, but in a particular case on a particular voyage. There could be a defect which has not been discovered and which renders the ship unseaworthy for a particular voyage. Um, however, this seaworthiness uh, in, in, in this sense, uh, in the sense of maritime safety, security, and pollution prevention, um, uh, especially uh, in the context of sanitary uh, requirements, classification, classification requirements, this is a uh, uh, Two tier, uh, let's say, uh, um, element of seaworthiness. One is that um, it gives a presumption, it creates a presumption that the ship is seaworthy. So it uh, affects the burden of proof in case of um, a damage or loss uh, between the parties of the insurance contract, but also. Um, this element of seaworthiness is a necessary element of actual seaworthiness. So a ship cannot be actually seaworthy if it is not uh, fully in compliance with the statutory um, and classification requirements. And now, finally, we are in the context of marine insurance. Again, um, in marine insurance, in the practice of courts and uh, in, in practically all jurisdictions, um, it is never an absolute standard, so it's always regarded uh, as relevant to the circumstances of a particular case, and it is always a question of fact. Uh, that is why uh, all uh, disputes uh, involving the issue of seaworthiness or anti-worthiness uh, are always technically very demanding uh, and uh, basically they boil down to a lot of uh, survey reports 
and expertise <laughs> regarding the um, technical condition of the ship, the nature of the feedback, uh, whether it is uh, it can be considered seaworthiness or not in uh, each particular case. Um, there is a very general definition of seaworthiness in the context of marine insurance, and that definition is found in the UK Marine Insurance Act in section 39, which, as you probably all know, really affected a lot, many, many jurisdictions all over the world, including also civil law jurisdictions in terms of uh, marine insurance law. And um, that's why I pointed out this definition, because it more or less is applicable in most jurisdictions. So a ship is deemed to be seaworthy when it is reasonably fit in all respects to encounter the ordinary perils of the sea to which it is exposed during insurance marine adventure. So exactly what we have so far talked about relative to the circumstances of a particular voyage. Reasonably fit and to encounter ordinary perils of the sea. In our uh, Croatian maritime code, we also have a definition of seaworthiness in uh, the context of marine insurance, and uh, it is found in Article 729. And it states that a ship is seaworthy, unseaworthy if it is generally unfit for navigation and if it is unfit for a particular voyage and for carriage that it forms due to technical defects. So now there are examples why it can be uh, found unfit, uh, technical defects, insufficient equipment, inadequate manning, overloading or inappropriate loading, excessive number of passengers or other reasons. So the list is just a list of examples, it's not an exhaustive list, it just indicates what could be the possible uh, reason for unsupervision. But uh, as you can see, it reflects the doctrine that I mentioned before, the do doctrine of general and special unseaworthiness. General, in the sense that it is a general physical condition of the ship and special that it relates to a particular voyage on which the ship is engaged. And uh, um, in comparative law, the concept is always interpreted depending on the type of marine insurance contract and this you can just go um no <laughs> um and this uh, means uh that it depends on whether it is how in machinery the insurance or car insurance contract but also in some jurisdictions uh, in particular, in the common law jurisdictions, it depends whether it is a voyage policy or a time policy. So the seaworthiness, legal consequences of seaworthiness are differently uh, uh, regulated depending on whether it's a voyage or time policy. Uh, uh, in our machinery uh, insurance, uh, seaworthiness basically relates to the navigation fitness of a ship. It does not encompass the uh, cargo is component of seaworthiness. Why? Because how insurance insurer, how insurance uh, provider uh, is not interested in the destiny of cargo. It is only interested in the destiny of the ship. Uh, on the other hand, in case of cargo insurance and BNI insurance, uh, the insurer is interested in the destiny of cargo because obviously cargo insurance. Uh, it covers damage to cargo in the insurance, it covers liability of the ship owner for cargo. So, in this uh, con these two contexts, um, cargo worthiness complement will be relevant for the uh, legal notion of seaworthiness in the context of insurance contract. Um, now, let's go through all the elements of seaworthiness. Uh, these elements have been crystallized through um, case law. And uh, definitely the most influential case law is English law, English case law. Why? Because the um, insurance, marine insurance market, uh, the London marine insurance market has always been leading 
leading uh, insurance and reinsurance uh, market in the world for marine insurance. Uh, and because uh, also other markets of insurance follow very similar standard insurance clauses that were originally designed at the London market. So because most of the world's fleet is insured under terms and conditions of uh, standard English marine insurance clauses, then um, obviously English law has become uh, rigid in this regard and gives most uh, uh, position most most of the positions regarding the interpretation of this clause basically and logically are found in the opinions of English courts. So uh, the courts have created so much case law that the legal writers now have grouped uh, elements of seaworthiness into about four four categories, and one is the most obvious one, the physical condition of the ship. So the physical properties of our generation, installation, firefighting system, and so on. But it has to be noted that not every defect in the physical condition of a ship leads to unseaworthiness. Uh, for example, um, um, defects that can be easily corrected during navigation or minor defect is it always uh, a case of unseaworthiness, maybe yes, maybe not. It has to be assessed in each particular case. Uh, and there is no clear definition of which types of defects would be or would not be considered unseaworthiness. The uh, standard that needs to be applied is a standard of a prudent owner so that the ship must be reasonably fit for navigation in circumstances of a particular case. And the question then is, would a prudent owner have required that the relevant defect should be made good before sending the ship to sea? Had he known of it? So if he would, then it means that the ship was not seaworthy. So we have to when there is a damage or loss of a ship, uh, then if the cause of that damage is a defect in the physical condition of a ship, then we have to ask ourselves, is that defect, had it been known, been known to the owner such as to make that owner decide not to send the ship to sail before he corrected that, he rectified that defect. So the test is of a prudent talk. Although seaworthiness on its own does not, uh, uh, when we talk about seaworthiness per se, we are not looking at the level of fault of a, an individual owner in that particular case. So it is enough to, to establish that there is a defect, and then we're not looking at this particular owner's relationship to the defect, but if we're looking at the standard of a prudent owner and what would that prudent owner do had he known of the defect? Would he have rectified it or would he have sent the ship to sail with that defect? So that is uh, how the case law has determined uh, the criteria to uh, differentiate between an ordinary defect and a defect uh, that will cause the ship to be unseaworthy. Um, and then here maybe it is interesting to mention the issue of a latent defect because it is also a notion of marine insurance and it is very important, especially in every insurance contract. What if we have a latent defect and what is a latent defect? So a latent defect is such which cannot be discovered in an ordinary survey performed by a competent surveyor and diligent surveyor. 
So if a diligent surveyor performing a normal, ordinary survey of a ship would not notice a defect, for example, a fatigue, a material fatigue in a in a little part of an engine down there somewhere, which is not visible unless you dismantle the whole engine, then that would be a latent defect. Now, is a can a latent defect cause a ship to be seaworthy? It depends. Again, it can. It can. If had the ship owner known about that defect, would he have rectified it? So, but this is only important to understand the concept of the general concept of seaworthiness. We are not confusing it for now. That's another issue which we will come to with the subjective relationship of that particular owner to that particular defect. That's another issue. So this is the first step. The first step is just to determine whether something is causing the ship to be unseaworthy or not. So the, the, the answer is the latent defect truly can be a cause of unseaworthiness, and it will be discovered in practice only once we have a damage or loss. It's always discovered retroactively, actively, because it cannot be discovered in the ordinary uh, operation of um, so, uh, but also to keep in mind, all marine insurance contracts cover latent defect as a special risk. So, latent defect is important in the concept of seaworthiness, but in practice, it will always be covered as a separate insured peril, insured risk under insurance. Oh. Um, the, the next element of seaworthiness is the safe man. So it is always important that the ship has a competent master crew, a sufficient number of uh, crew and uh, adequate composition of crew. This is always has to be in compliance with the uh, statutory requirements, but also with the requirements of a particular voyage. Uh, it is important to look at the qualifications of the group, formal and competency, but also um, actual, not only formal. So a ship, a, a, deal, a seaman can be fully licensed and, and uh, formally qualified, but in actual fact, really has no experience and uh, does not uh, uh, really uh, present an able seaman with all the skills that we would expect from a seaman to have. So um, we have to look at the formal qualifications, but also uh, his actual or her actual ability, skill to uh, work on a, on a particular ship. So it is important that the seaman have the education training in general and in relation to a particular ship. There is one interesting case, uh, the Star Sea case of, um, of uh, where we had the decision of the House of Lords in 2001, uh, where the ship was found unseaworthy because the master was ignorant of what was required for the successful use of the firefighting system. So the ship had this very specific firefighting system. Uh, it was fully fit, um, and uh, the system, uh, the, 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 all the installations and equipment were uh, correct. However, the master was not trained to use it. So the court found that the ship was unseaworthy because this ignorance on part of the master amounted to, to unseaworthiness. And there was a fire in the ship, which was not extinguished because the crew should not handle the fire fighting ship. Uh, and also, uh, we have to look at the crewman's health condition, illnesses, uh, their addiction. Uh, it, we really have cases of uh, unseaworthiness uh, 
uh, established due to um, no, notable uh, alcoholic uh, problem of the masters, for example. Uh, so uh, in each particular case, it has to be assessed whether uh, there is a, such a condition of the semen that might cause the ship to be unseaworthy. The following element of seaworthiness is the ship documentation. So this is called in, in, in literature documentary seaworthiness. Um, as I previously mentioned, ship must carry all the necessary documents, um, international and national regulations, according to the, the sector requirements of the flag state and four states. And uh, then there is the plan of the ship's balance and fuel system, ship's map charts must be kept up to date. Um, and uh, uh, this has been well established in case law. Um, for example, uh, this is a quote from uh, an English case. The Pride of Domingo, a vessel must carry necessary documents for the voyage, that is to say, those which may be required by the law of the vessel's flag or by the law of regulations or local administrative practices of uh, the port of call. Uh, so, however, this does not include documents which would simply facilitate the voyage or uh, the owner's compliance with the charter's requirement or without which the vessel must be delayed. So here it is clearly stated uh, what is the extent of this documentary seaworthiness concept. And finally, uh, cargo loading and storage is an element of seaworthiness when it affects uh, the safety of the ship. So not the safety of the cargo, but the safety of the ship. Uh, so overloading, inappropriate storage, bed trimming, etc., can be qualified as a cause of unseaworthiness if it endangers the safety of the ship. And what if it is only harmful for the cargo? In that example of chocolate and gorgonzola cheese, uh, uh, where they contaminated uh, each other, those two cargoes uh, by uh, smell. Um, um, so that is not important in the context of marine insurance. Is not relevant. It is relevant in the context of cargo work, in the context of character work, but it's not relevant when we talk about insurance of a ship. So for how insurer, uh, this is not uh, relevant. However, if the loading is such as to endanger the stability of the ship and its safety during navigation, then yes, that cargo loading itself will be relevant uh, for seaworthiness. And now we move on to the legal consequences uh, of seaworthiness, uh, and we will uh, look, we will compare, uh, as I mentioned, the common law systems and the civil law systems uh, in some general features. Um, and in particular, when talking about common law systems, we will shortly touch upon the implied warranty of seaworthiness. And uh, we will compare it to the concept of exclusions from insurance coverage due to unseaworthiness, which is which is uh, more natural to the civil law tradition. So first, let's look at how legal consequences of seaworthiness are regarded in the marine insurance. English of English law. Uh, and here it is relevant to rely on the Marine Insurance Act, uh, UK Marine Insurance Act 1906, and uh, as amended by the Insurance Act 2015. So, as mentioned before, seaworthiness is defined in the Marine Insurance Act in section 39. This is the definition which you already mentioned. Um, generally, English law 
differentiates between legal consequences of seaworthiness under voyage policy and under time policy. In the context of a voyage policy, uh, it applies the concept of implied warranty of seaworthiness, and in the context of a time policy, it applies the rule of exclusion of insurance level in case of loss attributable to unseaworthiness, where there is privity of the assurance. This is a very general um, conclusion of, of the main of the main features, uh, which I will now uh, explain a bit further. So first, let's look at the voyage policy and the warranty of seaworthiness of a ship. Uh, Marine Insurance Act, and this reflects centuries of English common law in the field of of uh, Admiralty law. Uh, in a voyage policy, there is an implied warranty that at the commencement of the voyage, the ship shall be seaworthy for the purpose of the particular adventure insured. So implied warranty. Um, uh, where uh, also the voyage uh, relate, the policy relates to a voyage which is performed in different stages then uh, then the preparation or equipment of the vessel uh, in order for it to be seaworthy is attached at the commencement of each stage of the voyage. So if there are stages where a ship has to go through, uh, through rivers and then through uh, seawater, then it will need different equipment and uh, the seaworthiness uh, warranty will be assessed at the commencement of each stage. So the assured has to take care that the ship is seaworthy at the commencement of the voyage or at the commencement of each stage of the voyage if the voyage uh, is performed in, in, in stages. What does it mean to uh, warrant seaworthiness? What is the warranty? Under marine insurance law in England, um, the nature of warranty was and has been regulated under Section 33 of Marine Insurance Act, but it uh, has recently been substantially amended, um, changed by the Insurance Act 2015. So, traditional understanding of the warranty of seaworthiness or any warranty uh, of marine insurance was that it was a promissory warranty. So it means that the uh, assured insured at the uh, when entering the insurance contract promises that um, something something shall be done or shall not be done and he undertakes that some particular thing um, or condition shall be fulfilled or he affirms or negatives the existing the existence of a particular type of banks. So at the commencement of the of the insurance, the insurer <coughs> warrants promises that the ship is seaworthy at the commencement of the voyage. Um, this means promissory and it means that this condition has to be complied with uh, in its entirety, it has to be strictly complied with. Um, any breach of that warranty uh, has a consequence that the insurer is fully discharged from liability under that contract from the moment of breach onwards, and there is no remedy for that. So from the moment of breach, there is no more insurance coverage and it cannot be uh, reinstated. That was the concept of a warranty under marine insurance before 2015. Um, and it was not important whether this breach was caused by fault or not, uh, whether, uh, so it was a strict warranty, uh, the, 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 the fault of the assurance is not even taken into account, it's not important, 
the only thing that is relevant is that the warranty is not complied with strictly at that particular time. Um, because this document was so strictly harsh on the assured, uh, there was a lot of discussion and it took many, many years. But finally, really, uh, English law uh, has changed in 2015 when the new Insurance Act was, was introduced. And the nature of the warranty was changed so that it still is a promissory warranty. As you can see, but so it says, uh, uh, first of all, the new law said a rule, any rule of law that breach of a warranty in a contract of insurance results in the discharge of the insured liability is abolished. So there is no discharge any. However, an insurer has no liability, there's no liability under a contract of insurance in respect of any loss occurred or attributable to something happening after a warranty in the contract has been breached. But only during that breach is in place. So if the, if the warranty has been complied with afterwards, so if the defect has been remedied, then the insurance coverage is reinstated. So this really looks much more like an exclusion from coverage, not like a discharge of liability due to a, a breach of a warranty. So all warranties of insurance have changed in this in this way, including the implied warranty of C verdicts. So, uh, again, keep in mind the concept of implied warranty of C verdicts is only relevant for the voyage policy. And traditionally, car insurance is almost always a voyage policy. So this will remain relevant for cargo insurance. However, in practice, it is not that relevant. Why? Because this is um, the, 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 the provision of the warranty in, in English law is a dispositive provision, which means that if the party will contract um, in a different manner their relationship, then the contract will uh, override the legislative provision. So in practice, we have standard insurance clauses, which are made part of insurance contract. And under uh, cargo insurance, usually the insurance waive any breach of the implied warranty of unseaworthiness. And then the clauses uh, from one uh, by the, the previous clauses here will regulate the consequences of unseaworthiness in a different manner. In this particular case, under Institute Cargo Clauses 2009, if there is unseaworthiness of a vessel on which the cargo is carried, uh, the insurance is excluded if the assured, so the cargo owner, is aware, is privy of that uh, is privy to that unsafe wordings. So uh, it's a different regulation of legal consequences. It's not no more of an implied warranty, but it is an exclusion which uh, remains in force if the assured is privy of the unsafe wordings of the vessel that uh, is where the cargo is, on which the cargo is carried. And very important because cargo policies are transferred from hand to hand uh, following the following the cargo and and uh, uh, the change of ownership of, of the cargo during transport. Once the policy has been transferred transferred to a third party, which is in good faith, then this exclusion does not apply anymore. So it only applies to the original cargo owner who actually contract uh, was aware of uh, or could have been aware of the quality condition of the ship on which the cargo was in part in first place, loaded on in the first place. Um, in the time policy, on the other hand, 
we have a different uh, legal solution. Uh, there is no implied warranty that the ship shall be seen worthy at any stage of the adventure, but where with the privity of the insured ship is then to see in an unseaworthy state, the insurer is not liable for any loss attributable to unseaworthiness. So important. We eat in a time of, and in practice, most marine insurance contracts um, that apply to ships, so how machinery, buildings with uh, um, B and I, there, there are time policies usually. Uh, and so this will be applicable to most of the insurance relating to ship. Um, and in practice, as you can imagine, it is almost impossible for the owner to be aware of, uh, of, a, of a defect, uh, which can appear uh, during a period of the year. Uh, while the ship is in operation. So the logic of the law is different. Um, it, uh, the law says that the, the, the insurer does not have to uh, warranty that the ship is seaworthy, but uh, if the, the ship is actually unseaworthy and the owner is privy of uh, that unseaworthiness, then and uh, the insurance will be excluded if the ship is essential to stay in such an unseaworthy state. However, another important thing is that there has to be a causation, causation link between the unseaworthiness, the defect that causes unseaworthiness, and the loss. So the insurance is excluded only to the extent that the loss is attributable to a uh, particular unseaworthiness. Now, uh, it is important to just draw it well upon of the concept of privity. Privity under English law does not correspond to negligence, nor to willful misconduct, nor to any level of fault. Uh, it is, it is uh, an, insured, an insured subjective involvement in respect of unseaworthiness, but not in terms of fault negligence or, or, or willful misconduct. It means knowledge and acceptance. This is what the courts have said. If the assured is become aware at any time of the of the insurance period of insurance, becomes aware of a defect uh, which could cause a ship to be unseaworthy, then that defect will uh, 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 Cause so the, the, the will cause uh, the legal consequences uh, on upon the insurance contract if the assured accepts that the ship failed in that condition. So he the insured has to know about the problem and accept that the ship continues to sail with that problem. Uh, knowledge can be also a blind eye knowledge, and that is um, a concept uh, particular to English case law, so, which means in practice, if uh, there is a defect uh, or an awareness of a potential defect on the part of the insurer, then, oh, sorry, of the insured, then uh, this insurer, uh, even if he, refuses to explore that problem further, just uh, not to face the, the, the full information and the possible um, conclusion that the ship was unseaworthy, then he actually has a point I knowledge. And this is enough to establish uh, privity. Um, if, if we talk about privity of a legal entity, of a company, uh, then uh, alter ego doctrine is applied, which means that uh, we have to establish privity of uh, technical crew management of the item company and uh, of the actually of the persons who are in the higher uh, level of management or in the in the board of the company. And these are the two cases that uh, have. Uh, fully 
describing the meaning of privacy under, under English law. Causation, as I previously mentioned, is necessary because uh, for, a, for a claim to be excluded from insurance, it has to be uh, a cause of a damage or loss. And uh, this uh, link uh, is established on the causa proxima doctrine. Uh, so the loss has to be attributable to unseaworthiness. Causa proxima means that we have to look at the dominant cause of damage because, in practice, you will uh, many times have a, a loss that is actually has resulted from a combination of causes. For example, stranding which is an insured peril, can be a consequence of negligence of crew, uh, in, uh, un, un, uh, uh, inadequate uh, max uh, charts on the ship, uh, uh, defective uh, depth sonar, um, and so on and so on. So that would be a combination of risks. And now uh, we have to see whether Seaworthiness, unseaworthiness was one of the dominant causes of loss. And for example, in this uh, case uh, of uh, under, under English law, the Monarch Steamship case, it was a ship which was detained in a British port, uh, but uh, uh, it was loaded with cargo, it, it had to sail, but it was unseaworthy at the time uh, when it had to sail. Um, and uh, because of that, it was delayed. And uh, in the meantime, there was a British government decision that the force was blocked, and so the ship could not get out. And, and the insurer said, oh, oh, the ship was unseaworthy, therefore that was the cause of loss. Uh, and the insurer said, no, 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 the cause of loss was a worry. Uh, because it was the Second World War, beginning of Second World War, and the block and the port was blocked because of the war. But the court said no, the dominant was lost with anti-worthiness. And the uh, insurer was discharged from liability. And now shortly, uh how much time do I have? Uh already. <laughs> we'll try to wrap it up. Uh okay. okay. I will be which uh this is I really almost uh, almost we will, you will do what five minutes or, or hours. I can put my parents. Okay, so so then you can you can take uh, another okay. ten minutes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah, I have about. Mm -hmm. I will be quicker than that. Um, so uh, that was English law. English law completed. <laughs> now we move to something completely different. Norwegian law. Norwegian law is very important in uh, for marine insurance because there is the Nordic Marine Insurance Plan, which is quite influential on the international market, and uh, it's so nicely and neatly. Uh, regulated that uh, it is really a pleasure for a scholar to study how they uh, uh, how the, 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 the Norwegian have developed the uh, uh, beautiful insurance clauses and a very extensive commentary of those clauses which is all available on the internet so under Norwegian law um, the standard uh, clauses are found in the Nordic Marine Insurance Plan um, and um, Insurance, unlike in case of English law, is based on all these insurance <coughs> principles. So under English marine insurance, we have a uh, principle of named perils, where only the named risks are covered. Here is a different logic. All of these are covered except those that are clearly excluded from the project. And um, um, when you talk about unseaworthiness, then the relevant exclusion from coverage is uh, uh, the, the clause which uh, relates to uh, regular, regulatory safety uh, uh, regulation. Uh, it is important also to uh, note the one major difference between Norwegian and English law. Uh, the Norwegian law follows the doctrine of attribution, not the, the, not the doctrine of pro, pro, causa proxima, the dominant cause, but the, but the doctrine of attribution, where when a claim, when a damage or loss is caused by a combination of risks, then uh, it has to be assessed uh, how much each risk has attributed to the loss, and then in proportion to that, 
the uh, uh, liability of the insurer in, in the tax. So if we have a combination of insured and uninsured risk, then the um, uh, insurance liability will still uh, remain for that proportion of loss that was caused by an insured risk. That is completely different logic than under the English law. Uh, it is important also to know that before 2007, the Nordic plan uh, prescribed, it used to prescribe that the insured is not liable for damage resulting as a consequence on unseaworthiness, provided that the insured knew or should have known that the ship was unseaworthy at the time when she was in the, when the insured was in a position to rectify the defect. So uh, that was the position before 2007. So that was the concept of seaworthiness, and the legal consequences were basically an exclusion from coverage, provided that uh, there was uh, knowledge of the ship on. So very similar to the English concept of all exclusion under a time policy. However, in 2007, uh, the concept was completely abandoned and replaced uh, by the provisions on safety regulation. Um, and why? Because at that time, uh, Norway promulgated a new law, Norwegian Ship Safety Act, which replaced the Seaworthiness Act of 1903. The Norwegians uh, thought that the concept of unseaworthiness was literally very uncertain because it was a relative concept and a uh, potential cause of many legal disputes. And they said, we don't want to deal with unseaworthiness anymore. We will introduce very specific insurance clauses excluding claims that are uh, that are a result of a breach of safety regulation. And this is what we have now under clause 322. Uh, it, it defines the safety regulation as any rule concerning measures for the prevention of laws that can be issued by public authorities, so statutory rules or stipulated in the insurance contract. So Nordic plan has specific clauses which uh, uh, list the, 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 the certain, uh, for example, ISM code, ICS code, uh, certain uh, uh, sets of uh, rules uh, which are then made part of the insurance contract. Um, but also uh, there's a possibility that the insurance contract can, at the beginning, uh, allow the insurer to introduce new safety regulations during the insurance cover. Uh, and uh, also breach of those regulations could, uh, could be regarded as a breach of the safety regulation if they are measures for the prevention of loss. Uh, and periodic surveys uh, required by public authorities or publications that also constitute the safety regulation. So it is very broadly, broadly defined. And then the consequences of the breach are the following. following. Uh, the insurer is not liable to the extent that the loss is not a consequence of the breach or that the insurer has not breached the safety regulation for negligence. So there is an element of negligence, which is important, uh, which basically means that uh, insurer can fully exclude liability only if he proves that the, the damage or loss is entirely a result of a uh, breach of a safety regulation. So not only partly, but entirely is a result of the safety regulation. And if you prove that that breach was made, only in that case can he uh, entirely exclude uh, liability. The burden of proof is such uh, that the insurer, the insurer has to prove the breach and the insured has to prove that he was not negligent. So if the insurer proved that there is a breach, then there is a presumption that the breach was negligent and then the insurer has to prove that he was not negligent. So that is a really uh, something very particular for uh, Norwegian, Norwegian law. Uh, there is also a right of insurance to cancel the insurance in case of a breach of, of uh, safety regulation with a 14 days notice. And uh, finally, uh, under Croatian law, we have a very traditional uh, concept of seaworthiness in the context of marine insurance. Uh, 
uh, whereby uh, uh, if a loss uh, or damage to the ship caused directly or indirectly by a defect in the ship or by a uh, uh, then uh, that is excluded from insurance provided that the insured knew of that defect or unseaworthiness or could have discovered it and prevented the loss at the end with due diligence. So here we have uh, two important elements. So there has to be an existing defect. There has to be a causation link between the defect and the damage, which can be also indirect. Uh, the insured had, uh, had known of the defect uh, and did not rectify it, uh, or he could have discovered it and prevented the loss had he acted diligently. So these are the three elements that have to uh, be put in place in order for the exclusion to apply. Uh, but the exclusion will not apply if the insurer was aware of the defect upon the conclusion of insurance market. So if, if we imagine uh, uh, for example, that an unseaworthy sh ship is insured against only portraits while it is on berth in a port expecting repairs after a casualty, for example. So it is not seaworthy, it is berthed, and it is insured, and the insurer knows of the unseaworthiness. And for example, it sinks. It sinks it in good weather condition. What do you think? Would that be covered by insurance? It's first thing in the form, insurance knows of the unseaworthiness and the ship sinks during, during this four years period. What do you think? Would insurance cover the damage? It's not on the uh, it's a port risk, so we are actually covering only the port risk while on work, while expecting repairs. We know it's not seaworthy. It might fall under this uh, provision uh, that the exclusion does not apply, but what will then the cause of sinking uh, if it's sent in good condition? And obviously, the cause of sinking was unseaworthiness. And unseaworthiness under a named perilous policy is not a common risk. So you can't uh, find a cause which would be a covered risk under the insurance policy, under Croatian law. Therefore, it would not be covered. But in case that it sinks in bad weather condition, then we can say that the dominant cause of sinking was the bad weather, extremely bad weather. And in that case, the insurance would cover because the insurer knew about the unseaworthiness. Uh, dominant cause was bad weather, not the unseaworthiness in any way. Uh, therefore, uh, the insurer knew about the unseaworthiness, so he could not exclude his liability for that cause. Um, and that brings us to the final uh, you know, question. What, is, what do you think is the future of the legal concept of seaworthiness in marine insurance? Uh, especially if we think about the technological developments, uh, the introduction of autonomous ships, uh, remotely controlled ships. Uh, will it have to be reformulated? What do you think? Well, yes, in the sense that the elements certainly will have to be reformulated because now we can't speak of a state manning anymore. We have to reformulate, for example, that element taking into account that now we have new profession uh, involved in the operation of ships, the remote controller, the software designer, and so on and so on. So this might, uh, uh, this will certainly have to be reformulated. Uh, when thinking about physical condition of a ship, the, 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 the contents of that concept will also have to be reformulated because now we have the software element. Uh, 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 certification will change certainly after all the RMO uh, uh, interventions now that we, that we uh, see are going on. Um, so definitely, yes, the, the elements will have to be reformulated. What about the legal consequences? 
how will we now uh, interpret privity? Whose privity uh, will it have to be? Uh, who will be those natural persons uh, who will actually be alter ego of the insured? Uh, this will uh, definitely have to have to change. Um, uh, degree of knowledge will be hard to establish in case of autonomous shift. Uh, that will uh, actually be fully autonomous. If, if you have a fully autonomous shift, uh, who will have the knowledge? Who will uh, be able to have that uh, level of uh, uh, subjective, uh, subjective knowledge of, of the problem? Uh, how will we assess the fault uh, if, if there is a diligence requirement in, in, the, in the regulation of legal consequences of seaworthy? And so this will certainly be affected. Uh, in practice, uh, I think that there will be a lot of problems regarding burden of proof, regarding establishing all these defects in, in actual fact, a lot of surveys, a lot of very expensive expertise. A lot of gray area, and um, and uh, then the next question is: Is it worth preserving this concept once we have remote control and autonomous ship, uh, or would it be better to follow the Norwegian uh, approach and just create very precise insurance clauses, which will precisely uh, connect consequences uh, 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 to the to the to the actual uh, breach of breach of safety regulation. So these are things to think about. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have any comments, I'd be happy to to share them uh, with you. Uh, otherwise, thank you for your attention. I hope uh, you could uh, survive this for me very. Stringent lecture. <laughs> so thank you.